This week, Reverend Wendy continues to explore Gene Houston's book, The Wizard of Us. Reverend Wendy includes practical ideas and suggestions to help us unpack what is blocking us from moving forward and how to more compassionately improve not only our lives, but the lives of everyone in the entire world. So this morning we are continuing an exploration of Jean Houston's book, The Wizard of Us. And this is a great book, a great look at the classic story of The Wizard of Oz. With the attempt to helping us understand how the story of The Wizard of Oz really is our story and that it is a story that describes the hero's journey. And guess who the hero is? Raise your hand. Pat yourself on the back. You're the hero. You're the hero. It's, it really is our story. And when we look with the eyes of a mystic at this story, we will see ourselves and all the different characters in their high moments and in their frustrating and disappointing and challenging moments. And when we look that way, we glimpse some of the great life lessons that can help us right where we are with whatever we happen to be dealing with in our lives. So today we're going to be taking a look at the character and what this character represents, the character of the Tin Man. And what did the Tin Man not have that he wanted? A heart, a heart. I've entitled the lesson, The Heart of the Matter. Say that with me. The Heart of the Matter. I was thinking about this this morning. You know, when we use the expression, well, let's get at the heart of it. I really want to get at the heart of it. We don't say, let's get at the mind of it. We say, let's get at the heart of it. What do we mean when we say that? The center or the essence of it, right? The real gist of it, the real meaning, the real significance, I think is what we are intending when we use that expression. To get at the heart of something is to get at the real essence of it. We live in a culture that tends to very much value the mind and rightfully so. However, it is often at the exclusion of the the heart. And really, the true mystical union is the union and balancing of the mind and the heart. Jean does a beautiful job in the book, The Wizard of Us, in describing and providing us some practice tools and experiences to help us experience more of our innate potential. Jean's underlying theme in every book of hers I've ever read and in every lecture of hers I've ever attended always points to the human potential that every single one of us is capable of so much more than what we are currently expressing no matter how well we are currently expressing right now. And that every single one of us has a role to play at this point in history in the place that we find ourselves, with the people that we find ourselves, and with the work or the opportunities we find ourselves in. That we are a needed part of the whole and that together, as we awaken to more of our human potential, we will not only change ourselves, we will help to usher forth a changed humanity and that changed humanity will help to usher in a changed world. Is that of interest to anybody in this room besides me? Yes, yes, to usher in a changed humanity so we can usher in a changed world. So we have the Tin Man, and we have Dorothy and Toto and the Scarecrow wandering the yellow brick road, trying to get to see the wonderful Wizard of Oz in the Emerald City, and they come upon a very odd sight in the forest, and that is the Tin Man. And he is frozen. Do you remember what position he's frozen in? He's got one hand frozen up, one arm frozen up. Do you remember what's in it? An ax. And Dorothy, this is significant to me, and Dorothy comes up to him, and it's curious. And she goes up to him, and she first knocks on his foot. And he sounds really hollow to her, and as he's knocking on the Tin Man's foot, she thinks she's hearing the Tin Man talk. Do you ever think you're hearing someone or something talk, right? A little bit of guidance trying to peek through. And then she knocks again on his leg, 
and she hears that little squeaky voice again, and then she knocks rather boldly and bravely on the tin man's chest, and that really sounds hollow. But she hears him say in the squeakiest of voice, oil can. And of course, he wants her to take the oil can and squirt him with oil so that he can begin to be limbered up and move in the first place that he wants her to put the oil is where? His jaw, so he can do what? <clears throat> so he can talk, so he can talk. And she squirts his jaw and he begins to talk and then he, she eventually squirts his arm and his elbow and that arm that was holding that ax for so long drops. And Dorothy asks him, did that hurt? And he says, no, it feels good. I've been holding that ax rigid for a long time. And I find myself asking, what are we holding rigid in our lives for a long time? And I think in part what happens is if we don't continue to cultivate our heart, we very easily can become rigid in life. We can become bitter and angry and resentful, non-forgiving, holding on to slights and grievances in the past and holding them like the Tin Man did for a very long time. Have you ever held something in your arm for a really long time? How does it feel? Not, not too good. And what, what happens the longer you hold it? Does it get lighter or heavier? It seems to get much heavier. And when you finally let it go, what does that feel like? Ah, right, this wonderful ah, as if your whole body, but even more than your whole body, as if your very soul is just getting a chance to exhale and you're able to set down whatever you've been holding that has made you tight and rigid and unbending and unyielding. A key point from the idea of the heart and the heart of the matter is that without heart and the qualities that the heart represents, we and life do in fact become rigid and quite stuck. And rigid things break far more easily than flexible, soft things. In the Tao Te Ching, Lao Tzu writes, at birth all people are soft and yielding. At death they are hard and stiff. Live plants are tender and yielding. At death, they are brittle and dry. When hard and rigid, we consort with death. When soft and yielding, we are followers of life. To be soft and yielding doesn't mean that you lay over and play dead and let people walk all over you. That's not what we're talking about. To be soft and yielding of the heart is to have a heart that is open. It is to have a heart that you connect with and a heart whose wisdom you seek and whose wisdom you value. So that you quite literally bring your heart into your circumstances and situations in your life and tap into the wisdom of the heart. Ancient civilizations seem to, or more indigenous civilizations seem to value and understand the power of the heart in ways that our culture has kind of forgotten. The heart is such an incredible organism. Just as the brain is, and we talked about that last week, the heart is equally magnificent. Did you know that your heart beats on average 100,000 times every day? And when was the last time you had to say, oops, heart, better beat right now. Don't forget to beat. When was the last time you had to say that? Have you ever had to say that? No that in the average lifetime, your heart will have beat about two and a half billion times. I can't wrap my, number, my mind around numbers that large. Two and a half billion times. That every single day, without you ever having to say, heart, do this, it pumps 2,000 gallons of blood every day through your capillaries, arteries, and veins. Take just a moment and put your hand over your heart and just make, make a conscious connection with that. Conscious connection with that. All that it does without you ever having to say, do it. It is with and through this heart that you and I connect with each other. I mean, the real connections. You know, we don't say to one another, 
I love you with all my mind. We say I love you with all my heart, with all my heart. I appreciate living in a time where we have the convenience of so much that technology makes possible for us. I appreciate that more when it works than when it doesn't work. But nonetheless, I appreciate it. And it would be very hard for me to step back and ignore all of those great devices that we use that make life easier on one hand. But I am concerned, as I imagine some of you might be as well, in that we may find ourselves losing the capacity or the, the, um, the practice and the skill of really connecting with one another heart to heart. I think that what we crave so much in life is true, sincere connection with another. And when we actually are on the receiving end of that, it feels so good and we absolutely know that we have just received that. Versus when somebody is just kind of paying attention to us but really not fully present with us. We are social beings, we, are, we need each other, but we need each other in authenticity and sincerity, in true, deep connection. And I think that happens and is conveyed in two ways. One of the ways that it's conveyed is when I am with you, am I really looking at you? Am I making a connection with you eye to eye? Or am I just looking up from my device or looking hither and yon or looking over my shoulder to see if someone or something better is about to come my way? You know what I'm talking about. But it also happens when we are connected within our own hearts when we pause and actually move our attention and our awareness in the area of our heart, then when I am with you, I am with you in a much deeper and much more intimate way than if I'm just showing up the usual way that we show up in our relationships. And so I long for supporting those kinds of deep connections, one-to-one -one and one-to-many. The heart is also a gravely underutilized and sometimes even totally unused source of wisdom in our culture. Do you know that in so many cultures, older cultures, the idea of the heart being a place of intelligence was gen generally accepted? That the Chinese believe that the heart houses the mind that the ancient Greeks and Babylonians believed that not only was the brain a center or a locus point of intelligence, but so was the heart. Do you know that there is tremendous research that supports what many of us have intuitively suspected, and that is that the heart itself is an organism of wisdom. Organizations such as the Institute of Heart Math, how many of you know and are familiar with the work from the Institute of Heart Math. Those of you who are not, please love yourself enough to go check out their website today before the day is over. Institute of Heart, H-E-A-R-T, Math, M-A-T-H. This is an organization who for decades have researched what happens when people learn to place their attention in the area of the heart and practice certain positive qualities or feelings while they are having their attention in their heart, doing their breathing work. This is what we practice a little bit of every single Sunday during a meditation. But the Institute of Heart Math has studied what that leads to. And besides the physiological changes it leads to that are measurable, like heart coherence, they also have researched the way that we are able to tap into wisdom of the heart. They have some amazing studies they've done where the heart seems to be able to know and sense something even before the eyes or the brain have taken it in. Would you say that if that were true, and it is, would you say if that were true that you'd want to really take good care of your heart and maybe really practice using it? No, am I the only one that gets jazzed by this? I find this stuff fascinating. Fascinating. I mean, it, I didn't grow up in a family or a system that taught me that the heart 
has wisdom and that I could learn to use my heart better. That's, that's a key concept. And that's something that's available to every single one of us to be able to use our heart better. We know now, scientifically, we know now that the heart also communicates with the brain. We've known for a long time that the brain communicates with the heart and all the rest of the nervous system, but the other way around is true as well, that the heart communicates with the brain and sends messages to the brain. So would it make sense to take good care of your heart? <laughs> to cultivate the capacity of the heart, to train your heart. Did you also know that there is research being done into the memory of the heart? Now stop for a moment, say that with me. Memory of the heart. Where do we usually think memory resides? In the brain, right? Memory of the heart. How many of you have heard that expression before? Oh, Keith, that doesn't count. You were at first service. Of course you heard it because I talked about it at first service. <laughs> you may have known it anyway. Memory of the heart. There is a fascinating book. I've only touched a little bit of the book. I haven't read it in its entirety, but the name of the book is Heart-Centered Leadership. And the authors are Susan Steinbrecher and Joel B. Bennett. And in this book, they write story after story of heart transplant recipients who suddenly displayed psychological changes that paralleled the experiences of their heart donors. Is that not fascinating? What is that maybe suggesting about our hearts? That there is an aspect of memory, of knowingness in our heart that we perhaps never knew about before. And they write that the parallels included re preferences related to food, to music, to art, to sex, to recreation and careers, as well as specific instances of perceptions of names and sensory experiences related to the donors. So Harry goes in for a heart transplant, comes back home to his wife, Mary, of 50 years, and is suddenly interested in a whole lot of different things. <laughs> Maybe that's oversimplifying or or forming an exaggeration. But the point is that they are discovering some of these things. You and I are living, as I've said many times before, in potentially dangerous and challenging times. There's no question about that. But at the same time, we are also living in times of tremendous potential and possibility. And we must remember the power of vision. We must remember the power of standing for what we are for more than what we are against, of changing the narrative and changing the conversations wherever we are to lift them up, not in a Pollyanna way, but to lift conversations up beyond the level of appearances to the principles and the truths that we absolutely know are accurate in metaphysics, in our spiritual teaching. To the extent that we do that, to the extent that we bring our heart into the conversations in that way, we can help to shift the consciousness and the awareness on the planet. And it is only when that consciousness and awareness begins to shift that we're going to see the kind of fundamental, long-term, lasting, real changes that we want to see, that we're going to see peace, that we're going to see social justice, that we're going to see unity, that we're going to see the end of separation, that we're going to see the end of marginalization. But we need to step in and have the courage, the heart itself, the very word courage is, comes from a French word, right? That means of the heart, we must step in in that kind of way. I want to bring a couple more points in before my time is over, and that is to say that when we talk about the heart, I think there is a tendency, I know there is for myself, to think of the heart in a more outward direction, to think of bringing heart to another, and heaven knows there's tremendous need for that. There's tremendous need for us to be a vehicle of loving kindness and fairness and compassion, and, and, we need to pause from time to time and check in with ourselves and ask ourselves, what is and what of the heart toward myself? How am I treating myself? How am I 
do I treat myself the way I tr would treat my very best friend? I had a beautiful, touching experience last Sunday in my home. I have been, John and I have opened our home for six weeks to a pilot program that we are testing here at the Unity Center. It's called Spirit Groups. It is a small group ministry program that we're going to launch come this January for everyone and anyone who wants to participate in. But we're doing a pilot version of it right now, and we hand-selected about uh, we had a list of about 70 people, of which about 45 people said yes, they would be a part of this pilot project to learn how to be hosts and hostesses for our spirit group program that will launch come this January. And so today marks, I think it's the fourth week that we have had in our home 45 people doing a small group, <coughs> excuse me, a small group process. And this past week was all about infinite connections and learning how to connect in the way that I'm talking to you about this morning, much more heart to heart and much more heart focused. And one of the things that touched me deeply with this idea of heart toward ourselves is one of the questions that was asked in the spirit group was, how do you make deeper connections? What are you going to be committed to in this next week in deepening your own personal connections? And most people talked about particular relationships in their life that they wanted to deepen their connection, maybe with the worker, maybe with a child, maybe with a spouse. And one of our members said, she was the last to speak, and she started to get emotional as, as she was speaking, which is beautiful because the groups are so safe. People really show up with such authenticity. And this beautiful member of our church said, you know, basically everybody is talking about deepening their connections with other people. And while I value that, what I'm discovering about myself is that I have filled my life with so much stuff out here. And I've done that in part as a way of running away from myself and not really looking more deeply inside of myself in terms of what is going on inside of me and what, where do I need to heal? What do I need to change? What, what's, what's really there that I need to look at? The courage she had to say that and the self-awareness was significant. So her story may not be your story, but it is worth as we explore what it means to expand the capacity of the heart to also check in with ourselves and ask, and how are we treating ourselves? How are we nurturing ourselves? And, and is it enough? And if it's not, to be willing to take a step in the direction of making a change. The very last point, and I'll only be able to touch upon it, that Jean writes about and suggests in this chapter on the Tin Man and the Heart, is the role of social artistry as it relates to social action. Many of us in this room grew up with models of social action that tended to be, not tended to be, were outright resistant and violent. When you think of the peace marches over the Vietnam War, I don't know how you have a peace march when you are so darn angry. Kind of a disconnect, right? I understand why the anger, but what we know from the level of consciousness, we can put it in very simplistic terms that are true. What we resist, what? Persists. What did Mother Teresa say? I will not walk with you for a, a walk to oppose a war, but I will walk with you when you have a peace march. Right? The idea being that we must stand solidly for something and let go of this idea of being against, which is the idea of the old model of social action. What Jean is writing about and what so many visionaries in the consciousness movement today are speaking about is a new way of being engaged in social issues. This is, I'll close here, These, this would be Jean's take on how we do that. She uses the term social artistry, I love that. Feeling good with a balanced heart and mind, you may feel inspired to move your energy out into the world to help others. You may feel called to become a social artist. Social artistry is the art of enhancing human capacities in the light of social complexity. It seeks to bring new ways of thinking, being, and doing to social challenges in the world. Social artistry brings state-of-the-art discoveries in human capacity building to social transformation. 
The goal of the social artist is to build a planetary society based on the principles of democracy, su sustainable development, human-based needs and values, universal human rights, environmental protection, protection, social justice, equality, and the sovereignty of all peoples worldwide. Can you stand with that and for that? I can too. Namaste. Thanks for listening. The Unity Center, transforming lives and healing our world. Check us out Sundays at 9 and 11. Subscribe to our podcasts and download our free app for instant access to a wealth of spiritual teachings, services, and events.